here's a thought since I've done so many of these things and had to be flexible, here's a thought. I will give my little five minute spiel in about 30 seconds. I'll pass it off to Ron because Ron, you've already talked a little bit about your mission, but you know, talking about what underlies how all this came about. Mm-hmm. Uh, great quote from Desmond Tutu. But I think it was actually someone earlier than him that said it. Um, you know, you can choose to pull people out of the river as you see them floating down and calling for help, or you can go up river and find out what's happening and how they're getting thrown in. And I think Ron's going to present some important information about how we got here. And, um, and then I think, how about if each of you talk about the different um, topics that you were going to discuss? I don't know, just briefly. And then if people want to know more, maybe we could have a special CONAM event for them on that particular topic, or we can, we can direct them. What do you guys think? Hmm. Well, that's, that sounds good. Um, you know, or I we could to... just do a little mini introduction yeah. and then if people want to stay longer, um, we can't do the breakout rooms, but we can find out if there's a bunch of people that just want to talk about one topic, we can go into more depth than one topic. How's that? Yeah, after 1230, sure. Okay, how about if we do that? We'll just plan that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, welcome, Kathy um, and Jackie and Robert. Hi, glad to see you. And D. Williams, what's your first name? <laughs> Oh, uh, you're muted. You're... There we go. Yeah. Dave, Dave? Yeah. welcome. Welcome. All right, Suzanne, you want to kick this off or should I do the uh, land acknowledgement? I think land acknowledgement would be appropriate and then I'll, I'll bring us in. Okay. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Good noon. Yeah, <laughs> good noon. Creator. Um, thank you for... Um, allowing us to finally get together. Um, So we thank you for another day and we recognize, honor, and thank the indigenous people, the original inhabitants of our lands. Now, I think most of us are on Lenny Lenape land. Um, um, I know I'm currently living on Mohawk land, uh, the easternmost nation of the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, Robert, who are the indigenous people where you are? Uh, Primarily the Seneca and Dina people. Okay, and Jackie? Are you from Eastern Pennsylvania, Jackie? Yes. Okay, and uh, Kathy? Eastern Pennsylvania. Okay, and uh, Dan- Dave, was it? Uh, yeah, Eastern Pennsylvania. Okay, great. All right, so we are honoring and um, thanking and recognizing those indigenous people, those nations that were here before us and did such a good job of stewarding the land for thousands of years. God placed them here and they treated everything with respect and honor. Um, Also, um, the Europeans who arrived here on our shores had um, recognized and adapted or adopted the techniques that and the attitude of the indigenous people here our, our earth would probably be in much much healthier right now so we recognize these people we thank them for their stewardship and we honor them thank you oh. Thank you, Sherry. Let me get this running properly here. Make sure you can see my screen properly. All righty. Everyone can hear me okay? Thumbs up if I can. Mm-hmm. All right, you can see everything. All right, so I'm just gonna run through really briefly. What I would like to see though is, hang on, I wanna put on gallery view while well, I've got this on the screen. Uh, did everyone receive their packet, their papers that were sent out beforehand with all the resources? Okay, all right, Paul, you did not. Uh, Paul, if you feel comfortable putting an email address in the uh, 
chat box, I'll get it to you. Uh, it's a series of links, places where if you want to put together a uh, Native American Ministry Sunday or Native American Awareness Sunday, that you can find links really quickly. I'm going to do this very quickly so we can move into some of the presenters that we're going to have. We can hear particularly from Ron Williams. Um, but if you're going to be preparing a worship service, then you want to get your pastor on board. If you're already a pastor and you're in here and you're interested, then you, you can help organize a group around you. If you don't have a, a Konam in your church, you can start getting one going. If you do, uh, working with them, you all can work together on this. Uh, it usually happens, uh, the Native American ministries, and I have Native American awareness because some of us aren't even aware, and we want to go back to the old title, and we want to start bringing awareness to our congregations. So either one that you want to do, if you want to celebrate the ministries, or if you want to bring awareness to um, Native American issues, or, or even to the fact that we have this Sunday, you can do so. But uh, normally it's held after Easter, but it can be held anytime. So if that doesn't work, then certainly hold it anytime. Uh, there's music available, liturgies available, hymns, and I have that all on that handout form that you can go to. Uh, you can use some of the music that is in our traditional hymnal, uh, that kind of honor and look for justice, or you can go with actual hymns that are in the voices hymnal, et cetera, that we have. Um, but then you maybe wanna have a speaker. So who are you gonna have come speak? You might wanna think about your theme what's your theme gonna be? And we're gonna have some folks here to talk about different themes that you could incorporate. Uh, but once you have a theme, perhaps you could go and look at some of the speakers. And I have the link to the Northeast Jurisdictional website for Conium. And there is in that website, a uh, document which has a list of speakers and topics that they speak on. So you can check that out or you can get in touch with one of us here in EPA. Um, but always you wanna be thinking about the fact that this isn't just uh, history, something that happened in the past, in memory, but it is living history, and we are living into that even now. Uh, Ron spoke a little bit earlier about uh, concerns of uh, how do we how do we figure out who we want to who we want to highlight here? Do we want to um, take care of our native peoples, or we've got so many things happening in the world? I would offer, if you look very deeply at what's happening in Ukraine right now, the Ukrainian people have been. Um, uh, categorized as not human. They've been, their languages have been taken away and they've been sent to quote unquote schools in order to learn Russian and Russian culture. This is exactly mm -hmm. what we've been dealing with in the US for a long time. So uh, that's been happening to the Ukrainian people. So a lot of the same stuff happening there now is what we've have experienced through native peoples, which Ron will get into more. So lots and lots of things that we can be thinking about when it comes to these Sundays and how we wanna deal with it. Um, certainly things like Native American contributions to 21st century culture. Um, we've got long-term Native American churches and missions. Those are also on those available on those links that I sent out to you. Uh, the children, the, the children, the young people that are being supported by scholarships through the monies that you give. That's another thing that you could highlight uh, or the ongoing things. And we've got, uh, I think, did Sandy come in? Did I see Sandy come in the room? Uh, maybe not. Okay. So we've got a number of things um, that we've dealt with as a CONAM and as a jurisdiction, uh, missing and murdered indigenous women, the boarding schools, uh, legacy, uh, and including the history and then creation care. So I'm going to pop out now though, because before, before we go into that, um, I'm going to have us talk and li or listen to Ron Williams, who's going to kind of give us the backdrop to some of this. So take it away, Ron. Sorry, it took a little bit long there. <laughs> Thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, as, um, uh, as I had uh, addressed slightly uh, before, my wife and I uh, conduct a, a mission or operate a mission to uh, support uh, families on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And uh, quite honestly, uh, uh, we wouldn't have to be doing this if it wasn't for for uh, a series of, of papal bulls that occurred back in the 15th century. Um, and, and, and what what has become known as the doctrine of discovery is really a combination of uh, edicts by, um, uh, by the uh, church. And we'll, we'll say the church as, you know, as though there was just one. Um, 
in, in this respect. But uh, those edicts be, uh, actually go back to a time in the fifth century when St. Augustine created a concept called just wars. <clears throat> and the, the concept of the just wars addressed, uh, addressed the, con uh, the idea that uh, it was um, it, to the benefit of, of the church um, if uh, if you uh, not only to the benefit, but as an obligation of the church to cleanse to cleanse new lands <clears throat> or any lands of non Christians uh, and subjugate them to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the uh, concept that that if you weren't Christian. Uh, then you are subhuman. Uh, we began to create the idea of subhuman uh, with the with the first papal bull that was uh, dumb diversus uh, by Pope, uh, written by Pope Nicholas in response to a request by the monarchs, uh, the monarch of uh, Portugal who was seeking uh, uh, guidance, uh, uh, religious guidance in in his pursuit of colonization of the African. Uh, continent and over the next uh, close to 50 years, a, a series of papal, uh, uh, of, of the papal bulls were issued uh, under the same thing. But under the uh, uh, Dumb Diversus, uh, the uh, papal bull of uh, 1452, the Pope uh, authorized uh, the Portuguese to reduce any Saracens who are the Muslims and pagans and any other unbelievers to perpetual slavery. So the beginning of the of, of the use of the reference to non-Christians as subhuman. Uh, in uh, 1493, there was an additional papal bull that uh, uh, specifically addressed Christopher Columbus's uh, uh, misguided uh, uh, conquest of the supposedly uh, uninhabited lands. Um, and they were described as uninhabited by the, by the church simply because it was not inhabited by a Christian authority. Uh, the, uh, the church uh, then at that time cited uh, any uh, lands west of, of a point that uh, directly went from North Pole to South Pole uh, along the Atlantic Ocean um, that was uninhabited by any or unruled by any Christian uh, uh, authority uh, to be uh, considered as uninhabited and that the uh, and residents of those uh, lands, uh, the people living in those lands were uh, essentially categorized as subhuman uh, and therefore could be eliminated uh, or, or put under slavery. Uh, there was no... Uh, uh, there was no relief to that to that concept. So these these papal bulls became the guiding doctrine of not only the Catholic Church but all Christian uh, uh, activity. Elizabeth uh, uh, at the time was uh, had been uh, what is it the Catholics do when they reject somebody uh, was not a Catholic, uh, but she she endorsed the concepts of of the, these papal bulls very strictly. In, uh, in giving permission of, of the English to uh, inhabit the, the uh, new lands, the Americas. Uh, over time, these uh, uh, references to these papal bulls became known as the, uh, as the doctrine of discovery. And uh, when, I'm, try, try, <laughs> I'm trying to compose this thing very, very briefly. But uh, as, as we moved into the uh, French and Indian Wars, uh, after the French and Indian Wars, King George, uh, I believe it was King George, uh, uh, designated the lands uh, along, beyond the Appalachians as Indian lands. Uh, and there was, uh, this, this generated uh, some uh, 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 bad feelings amongst the, the colonizers in the Americas who, who uh, petitioned the king uh, with uh, this thing they called Declaration of Independence and referred to uh, the savages. Uh, and there's a ding dong in there. <laughs> um, 
and and uh, this all led to the, of course, the, the the war of independence. It wasn't simply because of the doctrine of discovery, but the war of independence uh, really gave license to the uh, new nation to go ahead and move into the lands that were not theirs, uh, but to remove people. And we solidified the doctrine of discovery in this country uh, when. Uh, there was a um, lawsuit brought um, uh, before the Supreme Court, Johnson versus McIntosh. And uh, in the ruling that uh, of Johnson versus McIntosh, the uh, Chief Justice uh, John Marshall wrote that, uh, that while there were inhabitants on these lands before, uh, before the Europeans came, uh, those inhabitants didn't have a, a right to the land, but they had a right to exist on the land. Uh, that uh, gave license to the idea of property titles in the United States and uh, that only European descendants could sell property. Uh, the conflict with the Johnson versus McIntosh was that uh, uh, I believe it was Johnson that purchased the, uh, certain Indian lands from uh, a, a tribe. Uh, McIntosh came in later on and purchased, uh, purchased that land from the government. And so it created a conflict, a portion of that land, and it created a conflict, and that went up to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court said, well, um, the Indians had no right to sell that land because Europeans had conquered that land and, and become something like that. This is the beginning of, in, of, of recognition of the doctrine of discovery, which led to the manifest destiny. Manifest destiny meaning from sea to shining sea, you know, it's all ours. Uh, when I listened to, uh, uh, Woody Guthrie's song about this land is, is my land. I get a little conflicted because it isn't, and it never was. Um, that's the doctrine of discovery. It's why it's, it, it, we, we have, it, the doctrine of discovery gave us license to remove people from their lands or to take the lands that people had and uh, remove those people to other places. Ultimately, we've removed all those people. If we, if any of you have addressed, uh, have, have sat through our blanket ceremony, uh, you'll understand that a little bit better. But uh, it ultimately reduced the uh, uh, the property that uh, the inhabitants of these lands were allowed to be on, and it was a, just an allowance to be on the land. Reservations are an allowance to be on on that land. It isn't property outright owned by individuals or by tribes. Um, mm -hmm. Those. Uh, that brings us to where we're at today. Hmm. And if I could add, uh, the Supreme Court is, uh, as of 2005, upheld the doctrine of discovery as the um, Indian land management uh, guideline. The United Nations, the United Nations has uh, uh, has addressed the the concept of of. of rescinding or restricting the, the concept of the uh, doctrine of discovery. There are four nations who won't sign on to the United Nations uh, 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 resolution. Uh, and, and that's the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And uh, mm. uh, probably, you know, it, it makes you wonder, you know, mm. uh, the doctrine of discovery isn't gonna go away in our nation in my, in my lifetime, I know that. But the people mm -hmm. that, the people that uh, uh, are most afflicted by this have have, have been afflicted by this to, uh, have been allowed to be massacred, allowed to be imprisoned, which uh, many Native Americans believe uh, the reservations are nothing more than a prison. Um, uh, and, and, and it's an issue that that uh, we need to talk about more. Uh, I wish I could spend uh, uh, a full hour talking about this because I think there's more more that I'd love to share. Mm. Ron, I don't think I have you on the list of uh, speakers. I don't know if you'd be willing to come and speak at churches about this, but if you would, maybe. Um, I, don't like, I don't like to speak. I don't. <laughs> Ron, I think you did quite well speaking. just then. <laughs> I, I'm a horrible speaker, but I. going to be speaking I, at the First United Methodist Church of Germantown on April 3rd. Oh, Barbara, if you anyone have, would like to come. You have to let that out of the bag, huh, Barbara? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, I'll be I'll be speaking at and uh, and yeah, I I uh, 
I think that's I, I may not be the best messenger, but but I, I, I tell you honestly, I, I, I would refer everybody and anybody, I'm sure many of you know uh, uh, Mark Charles. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, you need to uh, you need to take a look at some of his uh, uh, of his YouTube videos. Uh, I think that he he is very very specific on 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 uh, mm -hmm. the history he goes back to is more than uh, uh, sufficient to really. But yeah, I, 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 while I don't feel comfortable speaking in front of groups, I really don't. Uh, I, I, I feel that I have to. And, and yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would accept an invitation more than likely from anybody. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. Mark, Mark Charles, uh, we the people is particularly good about the doctrine and discovery. Mm -hmm. And I was going to quick show you this, everyone. Um, Mark Charles also has a podcast. If you're into listening to podcasts, you can look him up. But here on our page, which is in the document that I sent you, are all sorts of videos. So if you're if you want to play a video, all right, for your um, Native American Ministry Sunday, if you wanted to have a special program, there are videos available on the website for our uh, conference that you can use and that you can bring into the worship. Uh, some of the things that Ron talked about, of course, some of the consequences are the fact that uh, we have extraordinarily high numbers of missing and murdered indigenous women uh, out, of, out, of, out of all proportion to others uh, because of this understanding that you heard from Ron about uh, people and particularly um, indigenous women being considered less than human and therefore throwaway and treated abominably. Uh, obviously, it's more complicated than that, but that's like the beginning of it. Boarding schools, as I said recently, as, as Ron described, children being sent away to an essentially cultural genocide happening where they needed to start adopting, quote unquote, white ways, uh, which were civilized, which were Christian, which it's all tied together. And then creation care, of course, something that's really important. So I think at this point, we're going to have some folks speak about those topics just briefly, right? And then... If you want to do more, we'll stay. You can stay beyond 1230. But who wanted to talk first? Oh, we had voting rights as well. Um, and we have a video on our Conan website to delve into voting rights if you want to, because we did a presentation mm. uh, at the annual conference. All right. So feel free if you're interested in voting rights and that's interesting to you. Uh, go have a look at that video. It's on our conference website. Yeah, that's for annual conference 2021 video that we have yeah i'm willing to go uh i would like to begin this presentation by first honoring my ancestors the murdered missing indian women and girls and their families my name is barbara revere and i live on the land of the lene lenape people I also have 6%, as we've traced it back, of uh, Oto blood in me. And this tribe comes out of Kansas. The murdered and missing indigenous women crisis is a modern form of genocide. In the US, 23 hotspots have the highest missing and murdered indigenous women cases. Fracking locations likely impact the rate of missing and murdered in an area. The crisis is exacerbated through systemic racism endemic within the justice system. First, let's look at our neighbors to the north. According to Wikipedia, the Highway of Tears is a 725 kilometer or 450 mile corridor of Highway 16 between Prince George and Prince Rupert, British Columbia, Canada, which has been the location of many missing and murdered indigenous women beginning in 1969. The phrase was coined during a vigil held in Terrace, British Columbia in 1998 by Florence Nazil, who was thinking of the victims' families crying over their loved ones. There is a disproportionately high number of indigenous women on the list of victims. Proposed explanations for the years long endurance of the crimes and the limited progress in identifying culprits include drug abuse, poverty, 
domestic violence, disconnection with traditional culture, and disruptions of the family unit through the foster care system. Canadian in, with the Canadian in, Indian residential school system. Poverty in particular leads to low rates of car ownership and mobility. Thus, hitchhiking is often the only way for many to travel vast distances to see family or go to work, school, or seek medical treatment. Between October 2019 and August 2020, six Indigenous women were found murdered on the Highway of Tears. Members of the Canadian Indigenous culture believe that several members of the Canadian Royal Mounted Police have coordinated and been involved in the disappearance of the Indigenous women on the Highway of Tears. In the US, American Indian and Alaskan Native people experience higher rates of violence than all other ethnicity. On some reservations, indigenous people experience murder at a rate of 10 times the national average. Additionally, homicide is the third leading cause of death for indigenous women and girls between the ages of 10 and 24, and the fifth leading cause of death for indigenous women between 25 and 34 years of age. I recently read that one of the little girls that was discovered was a year old baby mm. that had been kidnapped and murdered. Mm. Um, Okay, the 10 cities with the highest number of MMIWG cases that are not in law enforcement, that are not in law enforcement records. Here are, uh, I'm gonna give you the locations. One is where Ron's going to, Gallup, New Mexico, Billings, Montana. This is my home state, Omaha, Nebraska, Seattle, Washington, and Anchorage, Alaska. The city number of cases that are in records are in Farmington, New Mexico, Denver, Colorado, Oklahoma City, Rapid City, South Dakota, and Great Falls, Montana. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Vern, are you ready to take the stage? Well, um, you know, I think I would like to run through my uh, slideshow, if I can. I'm going to be focusing mainly on um, resources because this boarding school issue is such a huge story. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Let's see, now how do I get this open? Okay, there we go. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Okay, how are we doing now? Uh, all I see, you need to start it before you share it. Stop share. Yeah, stop share, then open, start the slideshow and then share. Oh, come on. You can't see that. Well, I can see the original slideshow with all the slides on the side. Okay. Rem Okay, uh, let me try this. I guess if you have to leave folks, we are recording this, so we'll try and get it, I guess. Mm -hmm. To the, how do you I see? Feel, I don't know where it's gonna show up, to be honest. Go Is ahead. Is that better? Okay. 
Yes. Okay, so let me go back to the beginning. Let's see, okay. How do I go back to the beginning now? Um, okay, here we go. Okay, um, I am not a, a native. Uh, I consider myself an ally. Um, uh, I'm Verna Colliver, in case you don't know. And um, I joined the uh, Native American Ministries Committee back in 2008 uh, after um, I uh, was assigned to the Native American Task Force on the General Board of Church and Society. So I decided to start with um, um, mentioning or, or highlighting um, the boarding school coalition. The time for healing is now. Support the Truth and Healing Commission. And I think healing is probably a, a, a key, should be a key emphasis for us. The Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition has a great um, resource. Um, it's a PDF file. It's called Healing Voices, Volume One, a primer on American Indian and Alaska Native boarding schools in the US. Uh, I'm going to uh, send a handout with links to all of these sources uh, after um, uh, our Zoom meeting and uh, send it to all who registered for this workshop. And in our Methodist church, um, we have uh, had resolutions going back to, well, maybe the 70s and earlier. And in the latest book of resolution, um, uh, the historical overview and theological foundations point this out. Government and religious institutions intentionally destroyed many of our native cultures and belief systems. To assimilate our peoples into mainstream cultures, many of our ancestors as children were forcibly removed to boarding schools, often operated by religious institutions, including historical Methodism. So um, I'm going to give you some uh, uh, resources here uh, from our uh, United Methodist Church. Siobhan Cornell is the executive director of the Native American Comprehensive Plan. And uh, that's a very key resource. And uh, we're not going to have time to see the video which he posted on Facebook. Uh, if you go to facebook.com uh, and search for Siobhan Cornell, um, boarding schools, you may be able to pull it up. Uh, but I will have the uh, link to the video. That is an excellent video. It You'll is. also find it on the uh, NEJ website. So everything okay. you need is on the NEJ website, folks. Thank you. For those that can hear, let them listen and act. And the points that he makes in that video are we need to support indigenous self-determination, abandon the practices to remove children from families and territorial domains, support movements and programs, seeking reparation. Uh, with native communities impacted by boarding schools, provide support and funding to investigate boarding school acts of just injustice, disclose all historic connection to boarding schools. And some of this is underway right now in the United Methodist Church. Another organization is the Native American International Caucus, which is headed by Raggy Rain Callantine of the Peninsula Delaware Conference. And they, Last fall, um, they um, um, set aside or, or uh, designated October 6, 2021 as a day of truth and repentance for our children. October 6, 1879 was the day that the first children arrived at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. We created, our EPA CONAM created a, a small uh, poster, four by six card uh, with using the artwork of Paige McNett, who um, tries to show the tragedy of the um, cutting off of the culture of these children as they came to the schools and it was buried and uh, they lost it. So uh, this is seeking justice for our children a day of truth and remembrance. The back of the card has information. I won't be able to go over all of this now, but I just want to say that these cards are available from EPA Conan. If you'd like cards, 
let us know and uh, we'll give you cards that you might want to share and distribute. And now for the uh, school that started uh, the boarding school era, Carlisle Indian Industrial School, uh, a little over 100 miles from where we are today. Um, there is a historical marker there. And the logo on the left is the logo of the um, Carlisle Indian School project. And the photo you see is one that many of you have probably seen before, showing the children at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. We at CONAM uh, had a Zoom uh, uh, presentation on October 6th. We call it a day of remembrance for Native American children. And we used this photo, which is a very evocative photo by Angel Decora, a Winnebago. She was pulled from her family in, De in Nebraska and taken to a government boarding school in Virginia. She became an artist and advocate for uh, Native American art. And she studied under Howard Pyle and later taught at the Carlisle Indian School. Um, what you see here in this painting is a student who has just recently come, still in their um, customary clothing, and a student uh, welcoming uh, this person in the school uniform. Looks very much like a military outfit, and which is how uh, General uh, Richard Pratt ran the school that he started at Carlisle. Mm. Uh oh. Try using your mouse. There we go. Okay. Okay. Now I'd like you to meet Sandra, uh, who uh, apparently was not able to join us today. Um, she is shown here with uh, Deb Hallen. Um, Sandy is our co chair, and uh, she is also a Circle Legacy board member. And she is also the um, president of the Carlisle Indian School Project. And this is a project that's developing to um, create a cultural and heritage center at Carlisle. It won't be on the grounds because that's a, um, um, the Army War College, but it'll be on land nearby. They have a wonderful website and all you need to do is go to uh, carlisleindianschoolproject.com Com. And visit the website to find a lot of information about Carlisle. And there are stories. And I just pulled up Sandy's story from the website. And here's an excerpt. As after we left the cemetery, we rode around the active military base, not sure what we were looking for, but sure at some point we were passing over the footprints of our ancestors. He didn't know their names or when they were there, but the story had been passed down from generation to generation that there were family members who were sent to Carlisle. It would be over 60 years before I would find out their names and another five years before I saw their images. Jeffrey Chips, runs in the clouds, had my father's face and hands. Bertha Chips, keeps came, had a... Um, I'm having difficulty, but you can read the rest over there. Had a familiar nose and sweet smile. The Carlisle Indian School has a website, as I said, and uh, you can um, learn more about it there. They show the past, the complex history, the present, modern day impacts, and the future what they are working on to develop uh, as their uh, cultural and heritage center. Now, if you want to know what to do, um, you don't need to um, uh, just have a morning worship for Native American Ministry Sunday. You could have a field trip to Carlisle. And now I'd like to end with some announcements. Um, in April, uh, we are having a, a special guest speaker Pele Turning Point, who is going to talk to us and share a Zoom presentation on her language immersion restoration project. Generations after loss of language in the boarding school, Hele generates hope by starting a Yuchi language immersion school in 2018. So she's going to be with us on um, April 
3rd, four o'clock, we'll be putting out registration information before long. So her project uh, involves a school and uh, um, teaching. You notice in the uh, uh, photo, the generations, the older generation are about to pass and with them may be the language. So um, they are helping to restore and pass it on to the younger generations. And you see all of the generations in that photo with Haley. Now, closer to home is the Nanticoke Language Revitalization Project with Rage Rain Palantine is working on. Um, she calls it a work of healing for communities. The boarding school stripped the children of their names, their language and culture. Generations later, this project now works to revitalize and restore the language with a 79 page illustrated book. Uh, the artist that I mentioned earlier, Paige McNett, is helping to create original artwork. And uh, this is a project that they're working to bring to completion. It requires a lot of money. So um, they're looking for support. And this is another way that you can uh, provide support. Uh, perhaps um, build a program around uh, uh, this project for your Native American Ministries around the Sunday. Uh, this is close to home. So I think as I started out with healing and truth, reconciliation, and I think it's just, um, just very appropriate that focusing on language to restore what has been taken away is something that we should be doing. Thank you. Because language embodies the culture and the worldview. Exactly. Exactly. So let's see, uh, one more slide. For those that can hear, let them listen and act. Learn the history, share the stories, support and advocate for healing and wholeness, and celebrate the triumphs. Thank you. Thank you, Verna. All right, who's still here? Yay. Okay. Um, Mike, you ready? Yes, I am. Yep. Okay, so let's see here. Um, start. Oh, heck. Mike's going to talk about creation yeah. care. Yeah, let me see. I'm trying to. Okay, so how do you how do you share the how do you share? Uh, there should be a green button at the bottom of your screen that says oh. share screen. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So, all right, let's go here. Okay, so this is just uh, climate care. And there's a lot of things you can do with climate care. We won't watch this video because things have been going long, but if you get a chance, I sent this out. Uh, you can get a copy of this so that you can check out all the links. But it's always good to remind ourselves of why we are doing this. And Michael Sluter goes into we are serving God and we're serving others uh, by serving God. And that's that's really our, our core is that we are trying to serve God by ser in serving people. Because. For someone like myself, you know, who does, I, I'm, you know, not, I'm not Native American. Um, I, you know, I, I, this is hard for me to hear these things. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, so I have to put my ego behind me so that I can move forward. Now, one of the things that uh, we know is that uh, God created the earth sky. Man was given authority over the earth and the animals. And Adam and Eve's job was to care for the garden. And biblically, we are, we are mandated to care for the planet. Now, the American model, and you could probably call it the European model, if you look down through these, it really was, um, I didn't, some of my things didn't get fixed. I uh, see so there's a little spelling instance in there. We tended to look at the earth as resources. How can I use this to make something? Uh, we didn't necessarily think about it as caring for more of a use. And that down at the bottom, I said, is this really caring for our planet? 
the Native American model had a more sacred view of the land, did not have the concept of private ownership, but it was the land was a gift from the creator. Resources were not to be overused. Uh, whereas like uh, the, um, the American European model, when they came across Pennsylvania, they cut all the trees down. They just used them all up. They didn't even think about what's gonna happen next. And from the Native American model, the earth and its resources were passed from the previous generation to you, and then it's passed down to your children. So you look at the earth, not as something that's today, but something from the past and something that will eventually go to the future. Very different thought processes on how, how we look at the land. Now, United Methodist Creation Care is moving in the direction of the Native American model. It's more of a biblical model. Uh, we believe that all creation is God's and that we are responsible for the ways in which we use and or abuse the land. Our natural world is to be valued and, and conserved because God has called humanity to be his caretakers. Now, I, I shamelessly stole that from um, uh, the, the, that link there. Um, and it talks about the most vulnerable live in environmentally damaged areas, you know, like our cities that have been uh, where they used to have major industrial uh, practices. Now those the people are living there. Um, by cleaning up those areas, we will be showing love and care for the most vulnerable in our society. Now, I think basically we'll go through this again because it's been so we've, we've gone late. What can we do? There really, I, I looked at it as three different pillars. There's the spiritual Sunday service thing that we can do. There are national organizations that we can join, but there's also a lot of local activities. And I think it takes all three. If we, just, if we focus just on one of these or maybe two, we might miss something along the way. Now for a spiritual or Sunday service, you could have a, a special prayer time for creation care. It could be done quietly. Or you can ask people in the congregation to create prayers to be, to be read during, during the service. You could have a special liturgy around creation care. You could sing hymns that focus on God's creation of the earth, uh, plant life and animal life. Or you could have your whole Sunday service revolve around creation care. You could also have a prayer walk around your church or your town. All of these things will help uh, spiritually understand the concept of creation care. Now, here's a long list. And this is uh, one of the things that's nice about this is that United Methodists are doing things. You know, we're not just sitting there and saying, oh, well, it's happened. We can't fix it. People are out there actually working. The United Methodist Women have uh, three webinars that you can participate in. One is climate justice, uh, one is just energy for all, 13 steps to sustainability. And they're all, I, I looked at a couple of them. I didn't look at everything because there's a lot there, but they are very good. They also have a climate justice simulator, which can help you look at what will happen to the earth if we don't take care of it. We also have creation justice ministries, um, which is a multi-church organization focused on a healthier planet. And if you look, there's, you know, what, what are the things we have to care for? We have to care for water. We have to care for energy because, uh, you know, overuse of energy can lead to a, a warmer planet, which could also then lead to more destruction. So what can we do? We can, one of the things we can do, we can support Standing Rock against the pipeline. This is a good example of how people groups can view land differently because if we look at the sacredness of land, it's not to be misused. And the land is for the public, for, for everyone, and not just for the commercial gain of a few. And this goes into the whole concept of, and I got that from Wikipedia, that wasn't anything brand new, but that pipeline was gonna take uh, you know, um, oil and move it from the north to the south where we had some processing plants to turn it into gasoline. Now, the one thing that, that helping Standing Rock will do is it'll keep the pipeline from going through the land, 
but it's still going to be <laughs> energy use. They're still going to be moving that oil some way because it's going to come from the north down to those, uh, to uh, I guess uh, down to the Gulf of Mexico where the refineries are. So other things that we have to do is we have to stop using so much energy so there isn't such a need. Now, along with uh, oil is coal. Uh, a, a lot of there's a lot of coal on what is what right now Native American lands. And tribes can be asked to sell or lease the lands for coal mining. And a lot of times the tribes have investigated how the coal is mined, saw the environmental destruction that it is, that happens when they mine. They decided that the destruction was too large and they say no. So you would think that, well, over the tribe said no. Well, these companies then through quasi-legal quasi or just completely illegal means push their way on to mine the coal. And you know, the government is semi-complicit with this because they don't stop it. You know, they might say, oh, there's nothing I can do now, but they don't go in and say, hey, look, you guys have to stop mining this coal in this area. So by supporting the tribes and associations that are fighting these companies is one way for us to support creation care. Mm -hmm. And here's some other things that we can do that are a little more closer to home. So, so we went, we had some national organizations, we had our spiritual. Well, here's some things that we can do at our home or church. If you live in an area that doesn't recycle or that it's difficult to recycle, you can become a recycling hub and then take all the, all the recycling materials to a recycling center. Uh, carrying uh, uh, through the earth by bees and gardens. We have so much devastation through roads, houses being built, uh, that there's not as much land. And then the destruction of plate wetlands where you have a lot of milkweed, then your, your butterfly populations go down. So you could create a butterfly garden. And um, all these things help. You might say, well, what's the difference if I do one butterfly garden? Does it really matter? And the answer to that might be, maybe not. But if all of us have a butterfly garden, well, now we're going to start making an impact. So we have to look at our efforts together as a whole and not just as a single person. We can advocate for the climate and um, through environmental justice. And again, these, these websites, and I hope you get a chance sometime to click through them because they do show you lots of ways. And we might not do all of them. But, you know, maybe clean water might be something that really, really focuses your efforts. You might say, well, maybe we'll do something. Uh, we'll make a poster about clean water and hang it in the North X of the church just to let people know what, what, what there is about the need for clean water or climate justice. You know, if, if you look at where these where these uh, a lot of what they call brownfields are where, that we've already damaged the earth and there's already toxic chemicals there um they're in they're in low income areas so we just let people live there because they, they don't have enough money to get away from it so really if we're going to be just we should go in and clean up those areas and again because we don't you know because we don't really have a whole lot of discussion time we'll just kind of skip over this so what else can I do at the church or at home? You can look for uh, sources of wasted energy, air leaks around windows, air leaks around doors. Do people close outside doors or prop them open? It used to kind of get me um, at our church is if we would be having a, a function and it would be like hot out, but people would prop doors open so people could eat more easily go in and out. Okay, that was nice. But you're like, now you're making your air conditioner work all that much harder, needing more energy. So where does that energy come from? In Pennsylvania, it's going to come from coal, natural gas, or nuclear, maybe. So by propping those doors open, we are actually not showing creation care. We should keep them closed and only open them when needed. Uh, here's one that, that, again, if only I do or only you do might not make a big difference, but if, if all of us do this, we can have a big uh, impact, positive impact on the planet, and that is not leaving our cords plugged in for electric devices, whether it be your cell phone or your computer. Uh, if you just leave it plugged in, even if the computer is not on and you have your cord 
energized, electricity is leaking out uh, at that point. So really what you wanna do is turn everything off at your switch. That way it reduces the amount of energy leakage that you have. Another thing is turning off computers when not in use. Um, they, they, they're much better at, at conserving energy than the old ones were, but you're still using a lot of energy. Turning off lights. Now, again, there's lights are a lot better. You know, if you remember those old round bulbs that used to get really hot, you know, we don't really use those anymore. But even the lights that we use now, if we don't turn, if we leave, turn them off and we don't need them, we will save electricity. Now, one of the things that's going to happen, a side effect of what's happening in the, in the Ukraine, is energy is going to become more expensive. So not only are you going to be saving by saving energy, not only are you going to save climate care, you're going to save yourself some cash as well. And uh, Pico and probably some other energy companies will actually come to your house and do an evaluation to determine if you might need new windows or maybe some more insulation in your attic. These are all things that we can do to have care for our planet. What else can I do? This is just a long list because there's just things that we do that, that waste energy or waste resources. We can look for uh, sources of water leaks in our kitchen, our sinks and dishwashers. In our bathrooms, we have showers, toilets, and the sinks there as well. That little drip that you might think, oh, that's not a big deal, that ends up being gallons and gallons of water over a year. And then if it's a hot water, you're paying to heat it just to throw it away, just to throw it down the sink. Uh, utility sinks, if you have a clothes washers, you know, all these areas you could have leaks at. Outside hose connections. Again, you, you know, if your house is older, you know, you might not think about it, that, that they just doesn't shut off very well anymore. And you're like, ah, it's not that big a deal, but you can be wasting gallons of water. Um, we've talked about recycling collection programs already. The other thing I think is neat that my wife does is she does a lot of work with kids and they do a lot of art projects. So we keep our empty bottles and cans and popsicle sticks and straws so that these kids can do art projects because you're kind of repurposing that used piece of material and then these kids get to do, make, do creative artwork. Cardboard boxes, everything comes in a cardboard box, right? We've got them laying all over the place. So we just throw them out because we don't need them, but you could use it for storage. You know, if, a, if it's a sturdy cardboard box, use that for storage rather than going to Walmart and buying a plastic tub, you know? You know, that way we're repurposing something that might be considered trash. Now, this is one I think is hard for Americans because we love our cars. You know, the muscle cars and all that that burn, you know, we get miles to a gallon of gas or gallons to miles of gas. If we drive less, if we burn one gallon of gas, it produces 20 pounds of CO2. That's a lot, you know, and you figure how many gallons of gas we go through driving we are just, we are harming the environment. And it, it's interesting because I know for myself, I think I had to learn this kind of the hard way. I lived in a fairly rural area and it didn't seem to me that driving your car, you know, like, you know, our little town, how is that gonna be a big deal? I know I went to a chemistry conference because like, I am a chemist in, in uh, New, Northern New Jersey. And I was stuck in traffic on Route 80 and I thought, oh my gosh, this, this whole thing about burning too much gasoline might be real. When you see you know, four lanes of traffic both ways just sitting there going nowhere, burning up gasoline. Another thing that you can do is you can keep your house cooler in the winter and warmer in the summer. Just one degree can make a significant difference over a year's time of energy use. And the other thing about that is it becomes a financial gain for you because you're not paying that money out to uh, for heating or cooling. Some other things that you can do, you can get involved in environmental awareness programs and maybe you have a building, a room in your church that can be a hub for environmental information. You can use electronic resources, all of these resources I've shown in my, uh, in my presentation 
Um, you know, you could just maybe have a computer there. People can come in and check it out or use paper resources. And I know that we would like to go to a paperless society, but we're not there yet. And so getting the word out through using paper might be helpful for those who are not into the electronic system. You can hold meetings to discuss environmental activities. One, I, one thing I do like to do is a stream cleanup. It's hard, it's, it's hard to imagine how much stuff people throw out their windows. So but just by walking down a stream with a couple of your friends on a Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, picking up trash, you can really help our environment. And also from some national organizations that you can do, the Sierra Club, they're always doing things. And that link is for the Pennsylvania chapter. Uh, national Geographic Society, they, are, they do a lot of work for uh, uh, nature and trying to preserve nature. And also the Nature Conservancy. That's another organization that's goal is to help have a more healthy planet and use our kind of our resources more wisely. There's another thing here called seed sharing. And it's a, it's a little bit different from seed banking in that the whole idea of the seed sharing is to use the, seed, use the original seeds. One of the things that's happened, especially for wheat, like uh, for those of us, uh, I've started to get it, uh, uh, gluten issues. Today's wheat has way more gluten in it than what it, what it would have been kind of like 100 years ago. It's, it's because gluten makes bread uh, rise better or work better. It gets it fluffier. And that probably doesn't do anything for the flavor, but gives it a better texture. They would use seeds that had more and more gluten all, over all the years. So as time went on, now we have these high, really high gluten wheat. So our bodies aren't accustomed to it. So they, it rebels against us. We kind of get sick from it. So if we have the regular seeds that we had that were uh, the wheat seeds from 100 years ago, if we started planting that, we could have a healthier society. And this, this is something I'm going to have to look into because this, I got this, I think I was off the internet or something, and uh, they were really trashing seed banks. And um, I participate in the North Museum in Lancaster. We do have a seed bank down there. And I have to look into it to see, like, is our plan ever to use these seeds or are we just going to store them until they actually don't work anymore? So, there, you know, I, I wrote this and I, I'm telling it to you and I'm just kind of like getting a little ding inside of me saying, me. I need to look into this to see what I could be doing from a seed sharing perspective. Okay, that's all. And I did, again, I went through it a lot faster than what I expected because I thought we were going to have like 40, 45 minutes a piece. Are there any questions? <clears throat> okay. Uh, can you stop sharing now? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Okay. At the top, there should be an option. Oh, there it is. The red, the red one. Stop. Yeah, red yeah, means stop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you to our presenters very much. Um, do you have uh, any questions or comments about anything that you've heard today? Mm. Nope, nobody. Any of the presenters want to make additional comments? You know, there was just there was one thing that Ron had mentioned in, about um, how we uh, how we look at the land that if it's not used for something that is that's kind of is it, we Europeans would say consider it bad. There, I lived in Mifflinburg and that center of the state and just outside of Mifflinburg all the way to like Milheim, which is getting close to State College. In 1900, there's a strip of land there that, that was decided that it was wild and unused. Then the, uh, the Laurelton Lumber Company was formed and they claimed the land for themselves. 
they just claimed it. Mm. <laughs> Nobody technically owned it on paper, so they just took it. I mean, you know, like in 1900, that was happening. It, it's something innate about, I guess, I want to say about Europeans that feel that they just have to transform everything from its natural setting into, into something that they consider useful. Mm. Well, they see man as the center of the universe. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, I mean, God gave Adam and Eve care of the um, yeah. of the garden, but not necessarily dominance yeah. or, or conquering. I mean, uh, you know, when Europeans came to the New World, they said, oh, these Indians aren't using the land. They don't know anything. Well, they knew a lot more than um the europeans thought because we're now you know um needing to rely on their traditional knowledge of how to how everything is in balance you know the europeans yeah. just wanted to oh i'll use that i'll use that i'll use that yeah. you know yeah. uh, and the uh, native americans are, are always thinking of seven generations coming up you know, how, how, what are we leaving these children and grandchildren, great grandchildren? I just wanted to uh, comment, this is Barbara again, that uh, I feel very badly that I couldn't talk <laughs> for 40 minutes about the murdered, missing mm -hmm. girl crisis, that I didn't give it justice at all. And I'm willing to put myself out there. And I'm also uh, wanting people to know that Deb Holland, now the Secretary of the Interior, has done a lot around the mur murdered missing Indian women and girls issue. Mm -hmm. In fact, she opened up and I did it for two years. And I guess as Ron would understand, it put me in a dark space so I'm taking a year off. But I communicated with the families of murdered missing Indian women in uh, Pine Ridge and uh, recorded their stories. Mm -hmm. And the stories were then translated into native language and they're being stored in the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. And it was one thing that we saw that we could do that at our nation capital, they will forever be remembered, mm. especially the stories from the families. So mm. if anyone wants me to do a presentation on it, I am more than willing to do it. Great. Well, thank well, you, I'm Barbara. Up, I'm signing up names for the NEJ website, right, Barbara? Sounds like <laughs> I'll, be in touch with, I'll be in touch with Barbara uh, about that because it's always good to have more names. I was gonna show you guys real quick. Oh, um, hang on here. I'm sorry. Where's the? All right, this is no good. I'm trying to get you to the, the NEJ website. I was going to show you. Uh, this is what it looks like, so that you know. I'm also going to send out updated sheets. So you heard Mike Shiflet shared that he would have the the PowerPoint for you. I will send that out to Lindsay and get it to everyone. But this is the website that you'll go to. And if you look here, all the things that we talked about are here. And if you click on these links, it'll take you to other pages. Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And Barbara, I wanna get you on there. <laughs> um, educational opportunities. So if you wanna do anything, we've got other things too, race-based mascots, sovereignty rights. All right, some of you know the Mashpee Wapanoag tribe we're having issues with the government and they got their land back. So, and there's also prayers, litanies and liturgies in particular one that we did here in, in Eastern PA. So I'm, I'm scrolling very quickly, but please have a look. There are so many resources. All these pages have other things as well. Okay. And I will also send you the link to Sandy Chinchilli's presentation, part of what she was gonna talk about with the voting rights. So you can look at that video. And I also wanna mention, oh, go ahead, Verna. April 3rd, uh, our uh, Zoom presentation uh, look for uh, registration information on the uh, uh, conference website. Hala Turning Heart will be talking about her language project. And uh, mm. my, my re list of resources mm. will also be sent to you on the boarding school era. Mm. 
Yeah, and, and Kelly is uh, United Methodist, and her father, uh, Richard Grounds, uh, Dr. Richard Grounds, uh, started this project, and he's also United Methodist and one of the oldest uh, United Methodist churches in the United States. The UT peoples, of course, were down there in what we did call later the Georgia colony and that area. And so the Wesleys came there. And so they're one of the first, along with the Choctaws and Chickasaws, that uh, introduced um, Methodist, actually, Methodism to indigenous uh, peoples. So uh, mm. they're some of the oldest Methodists you'll ever meet. So come and come and hear more. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Well, I have one more comment about the boarding schools, you know, people talk about um, the poverty and the unemployment and um, drug uh, use and alcohol use on uh, by Native Americans. Well, if you were taken from your home when you were six and didn't get to get, weren't allowed to go back until you were 17, you would be totally disconnected from your family, mm -hmm. from your culture, from your language. And you never learned how also you didn't have a parent. And so maybe you went home, you got married, you didn't know how to be a father or, or a mother you know, because you never had a role model. So your children are suffering what we call intergenerational trauma because um, they were they don't know where they belong. Um, they, you know, and especially now that I have a friend who's having an issue, they adopted um, native children. I think they're in Wyoming. And now the children are... Um, teenagers and they're having behavioral issues you know well you know you don't those kids don't know where they belong they're in a white home with loving parents but that's not who they are that's not who they were originally so the boarding schools have generated so much pain and sorrow and uh, canada about 10 years ago or maybe even 20 years ago started a truth and reconciliation program um, where they invited people of survivors of the boarding schools to talk and many of these people were old of course you know it may have been 50 years ago or more that they attended and it was the first time they talked about their experience and this in itself is healing and actually, that uh, one of the things that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation program was the pledge to find, use the underground radar to find, you know, the buried children. And that's what happened in this past year. The, that uh, uncovering of all the graves and the unmarked graves and the mass graves is because of a result of the Truth and Reconciliation work in Canada. And, and so, that, uh, Sherry, that's what the Boarding School Healing Coalition is looking for. A, yes. For Congress to set up such a commission for truth and healing in the United States. So I just, uh, I just, I, I was reluctant to do this, but uh, I, I need to correct something that you said earlier, and that is that uh, the Carlisle Indian School wasn't the first. Indian boarding school, boarding school, Indian boarding schools had been set up on reservation. It was the first off reservation boarding school, but it was uh, the first federal off reservation off, boarding school. Well, it was first off reservation period. Oh, and, really? Okay. And uh, but but uh, the boarding schools um, uh, uh, set up by missionaries uh, uh, throughout the uh, country were were existent ever since uh, the early seventeen or the late seventeen hundreds. Thank you. Okay. And I just want to add, I'm going to update the uh, links to the uh, United Methodist Women website. Some of you may know they changed to United Women in Faith just two days ago, and their website is all different. So I'm going to check <laughs> those things with you because those videos are now out of date from Mike's presentation. So I'm going to try and find them. If I can't, um, mm. I'll be able to do a search on their website. Okay. You're so misguiding us. Oh, my. <laughs> Just be aware, all the all the United Methodist Women stuff, their resources are amazing, but they're now women in faith. So you'll have to do a different uh, website. I will send that with the stuff to Lindsay to go out to all of you. Okay. And please, 
give Lindsay our our, our good thoughts. Gosh, <laughs> she, yeah, she needs it. <laughs> oh my. Well, if there are no uh, other comments or questions, uh, Suzanne, would you close us in prayer, please? Oh my! All right, I'd be honored. Thank you. Holy One, I give you thanks for the many ways in which you have brought us together. I trust that those who are here were meant to be here. And I pray that their hearts and their minds might be convicted to go back to their churches and their ministry areas and share with all that they meet, what they learned here, and to delve in even deeper so that we might become advocates, allies, and for those of us who are Native, might be able to find some healing and some ability to join together in order to work for justice for indigenous peoples, mm. for all people. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. For good, to you. good to see you all. Take yep, good all. to see you. God bless. Be well. And thank I'll you so much, you, Ron, for speaking. I'll see you, Barbara. You. Didn't feel like you could speak. I thought that was wonderful, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you all know when I'm making my next trip. Okay. okay. Good. Mm -hmm.